Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here with you all. And um, thank you for inviting me to bring these um, these last remarks. I will try to keep them lively <laughs> so because I know this is the last uh, thing we'll, you'll be hearing tonight. And kind of following the principles of the work that we do, which are rooted in the Jemez principles for democratic organizing, one of the, 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 the first principle of the Jemez principles is let the people speak for themselves. So I'd like to start with a short video of a community really speaking from the, the context of environmental justice um, as, they, as they experience it in the community. So I am going to quickly I bet I have way too many screens open. Okay, good. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to hear and see this. Please just drop a note in the chat if it starts buffering, because you never know what these situations. <clears throat> Baytown is made of old money, lower to middle class families and pollution. But if you get a job at a chemical plant, you don't have time to think of a solution. I guess my brother, my uncle, and my cousins are sellouts because they went industrial instead of the drug route. Refinery city lights and pipes run along the Gulf Coast. The smoke boasts with sulfur air. It's a wonder. Anyone's able to take a breath. We're so used to it, we forget. Soon, the sons and daughters won't be able to drink the water. They say the first priority is the people, but the people are the ones being excluded and uprooted. Just ask Archer Courts, ask George Washington Carver Elementary, or ask the suburban life. Exxon Sacrifice, AKA Brownwood Neighborhood. God bless social media, but Flint ain't the only case of complexion without protection. Baytown, AKA Dirty Bay, is surrounded by giant toxins threatening this city in every way. We see the huge steel from our window sills make jokes as we choke. We've been possibly dying from this kind of poison oak. It's no mystery that the black and brown communities are being targeted. Black lives matter, but not when they're expendable and making money is good for the market. Give them a fine, it's fine. They can afford it. We live with the headaches, the shortness of breath, and watery eyes. They keep building, they pay for it. Constantly trying to heal ourselves and repel the environmental destruction. Breathe it in. And breathe out. Yes, so the irony of that um, of that clip is that the uh, this that clip was made back in 2016. So when you see the masks that the children were wearing, that was far before COVID-19 became our reality. And unfortunately, it really speaks to the reality that that others were speaking to earlier in the in the panel on air that the air wasn't safe for us to breathe the toxins the the germs and so forth in the air for us were there way before covid-19 became this latest threat that that ma that that made universe masking universal whereas for our communities um masking is uh is uh, it's something that was already a, a necessity to be able to 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 breathe in some ways so as a uh, and I will I will share that link so that um, folks can can see that um, further. And I'll make sure you and there'll be another video at the end. So I'll also make sure you have that link as well. So again, it it, it is an honor to be here with you all. I um, 
I live in Baltimore, Maryland, an unceded Piscataway territory, but right now I'm kind of sheltering from the winter in a place called Grant Valcaria, Florida, which is on unceded Seminole territory. So it's, uh, it's I'm literally at the, uh, the exact opposite end of the nation for most of the folks who are tuning in here. But I appreciated being able to, to listen from the beginning to the, the panels on air and water and um, looking forward to hearing more from the panels on land and the built environment as well as racism and, and, and inclusion. And it really is, those, those really comprise the, the heart of, of this overarching um, conversation around environmental injustice. So hearing the, the folks talking about the places that the, the uh, predominant um, um, toxic facilities being um, built near indigenous lands in Washington state. And uh, we often talk as the NAACP about the, um, about the fact that African-Americans um, are more likely to, to live near toxic facilities, that 71% of African-Americans live in counties in violation of federal air pollution standards, that uh, African-American family making $50,000 a year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white American family making $15,000 a year. So we see how we, we share that common ground in terms of the disproportionate exposure to, um, to, to toxins. Um, the sister talking about the life expectancy being um, eight years less on average and across the various BIPOC communities. Um, the, the folks talking about the fisheries and the challenges around the fisheries. We were, I was in Alaska and um, a meeting with folks who were talking about the red dog mine there that had violated the federal, um, the, um, the water, the, the Clean Water Act by uh, 600 times and have been and have been um, cited 600 times for for violating the Clean Water Act and it just is uh, when we think about kind of things like the three strikes rules and how few chances we get as people in terms of any any violations or infractions and the notion that something can still be operating after violating the law 600 times and counting. Um, we also um, talk about kind of the, we didn't really talk about so much today, but I was, as, 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 as the descriptions were, were, were being made around um, violation of air and water, it made me also think about the pipeline fights. And we had done a, um, a couple of years ago when the, well, a few years ago when the Keystone XL pipeline um, conversation was happening, we, we were working with the communities that with the NAACP units that were near that were there where people were either workers or they were living near the the pipeline path so we wanted to get a sense of what their what their feedback was and we spoke specifically to some of the workers on the pipelines and they they and, and and we were kind of trying to figure out like is there going to be a tension as we often see with people whose livelihoods are impacted um, by 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 trying to, to to shift us away from the fossil fuel infrastructure and operations. So we checked in with them, and we were we were struck by their responses when they talked about how um, about being present and seeing where the um, states um, in terms of police and so forth were how they were interacting with the indigenous folks um, along the pipeline and they said you know that we what that what what they saw in terms of what was happening to the indigenous brothers and sisters reminded them of the times when and the civil rights struggles were happening and people were had hoses turned on them or had their their homes overturned and their and their kind of few items were turned were um were were, were um destroyed or or otherwise and they they really noted the 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 sacred items that were being defiled and the and the the forced removal from from land and and uh, we ended up writing a um a uh a blog that really detailed their their comments um, that was called "We Know Struggle," because they 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 found so many parallels and so much in the way of, of of common cause. And even though they saw that their livelihoods would be impacted, they they really uh, pushed to stand in solidarity around those those challenges. 
So as we have this conversation today, we're having this conversation at a time of, of national mourning, as we know, um, not just in terms of API communities that were impacted by the murders of the eight people in Atlanta, but in all communities when we really cling, um, embrace the adage of no one is free when one is oppressed. Um, we're having this conversation at a time when the racial awakening began with the televised murder of George Floyd who died with a knee on his neck with no regard to his right to breathe and his right to, to life. Um, this conversation is happening at a time when even when the vaccine is on coming on land, we still are mourning the loss of over a half a million um, people, largely BIPOC people and frontline workers whose work was seen as essential, but by the lack of protections that they were afforded, we see that their lives were not deemed to be essential. Um, I was on a panel and this person named Steve Benjamin, who was African-American mayor of uh, Columbia, South Carolina, he said that COVID-19 served as an X-ray to expose the broken bones of American society. And that really stuck with me because that's exactly what we saw. Because it really exposed what we already know as frontline communities who are all already seeing these injustices, who are already masked before this happened, who knew on um, March the 13th when there was still really in Washington state, the, the, um, the one um, um, nursing, nursing home that was impacted and I think it was Kirkland. Um, I was uh, I was away on, on and I was kind of watching the whole thing and want, imagining what would unfold. And, and that day I just wrote, I took 19 hours and wrote this document called the 10 equity implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. And at that time people were, I mean, it was, it, 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 you know, some folks almost called it, called it pro, at the time and afterwards, people almost called it prophetic, but really not even close. Anybody who's working on the front lines is all the people, the panels before um, would, would see, because we know those broken bones of society because those broken bones are our everyday lives that we're interacting with, that we're patching up every single day. And so it was easy to write that, um, that 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 was hauntingly um, predictive of, of what really unfolded. So we're also having this conversation at a time when profits over people and planet has brought us to this moment of catastrophic climate change already being upon us. People can kind of still seem to make it sound like it's something that's happening far off, but we know places like Barbuda that's no longer inhabitable, places like you know Puerto Rico that was ravaged by the storms and other places and, and fisheries that are again being impacted and changing the ways of life for whole swaths of people. And so even with the commitments of this administration, we still don't have anywhere near the depth and the extent of the commitments to bold action that we're going to need to curb the progression um, of, 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 of climate change. So so we on the front lines, again, hold a deep-seated recognition of what's brought us to this moment in terms of disregard for people and planet by those in power. And even as we recognize that it's a, it's a problem as society, we still kind of uh, move into being mired in false narratives and false solutions, false solutions like uh, food in our food and agriculture sector, the uh, genetically modified seeds. You, you people have heard of Monsanto and they create these seeds called, that people commonly call terminator seeds, but they're seeds that just have one cycle. And so again, developed against the very laws of nature, all for profit. And not only is it putting, making, um, it's, uh, it's uh, changing the laws of nature in terms of the, their own crops, but in places like India, those seeds are blowing over into other people's crops, and then they have kind of a viral kind of um, a viral effect, and so it, it ends up with those farmers also being dependent on those seeds because the regenerative seeds that they were a seed-based crop that they were growing before then is no is overtaken by the viral nature of these terminator seeds, and um, and and so we see the work of Vandana Shiva where she talks about the uh, tie to the high rates of suicide among, among farmers there. So we have whether it's genetically modified seeds or genetically modified foods in a place where we have so much abundance on earth, but yet we, uh, you know, again, for profits, the agriculture sector is genetically modifying foods. And then there's the confined animal feeding operations, again, that are not only cruel to the animals within it, 
but also um, tend to be located in low income communities and BIPOC communities and and the pollution from those facilities are, are, are harming the, the, the our animals and the communities around them. When we talk about our energy sector, we continue to prop up a utility business model as the pre previous speaker talked about, which is really focused on profits for a very wealthy few. We have these utility CEOs that are making on average $9.8 million per year, where you, where you have folks who are getting shut off for non-payment for a couple of $60 bills. And we put out a report a couple of years ago called Lights Out in the Cold, Reforming Utility Shutoff Policies. This is a human rights matter to really lift up the fact that we have people who are lighting their homes with candles after they have their electricity shut off and they've burned down their homes and, 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 and lost lives for their families. People who are using space heaters once their oil and gas is shut off you know, so they can heat their homes and again, burning down their, their homes and, um, and losing lives as a result. A grandmother in New Jersey, the very summer after we put out that report, she had gotten behind on her bill, but her son found out that she was behind and she, he paid off her bill. But two days later, the system hadn't caught up to her having her bill being paid and they shut off her electricity regardless. On July 18th in the, in the uh, dead of a, wind, of, a, of a heat wave, when she was dependent on her respiratory res respirator to breathe and she died as a result. So we have all of these folks who are literally paying the price of poverty with their very lives while the CEOs are making millions upon millions of dollars every year um, um, on that, on, on the backs and on the lives of frontline communities. So we have a, a energy system that again, instead of having as its primary purpose to provide energy, affordable energy for all, it has as its primary purpose to provide wealth and power to a very few. And so we have, so as a result, we have that kind of this disposability of, of again, essential workers who are in the mines um, um, mining for coal and they, 76,000, Coal miners have died of 19, since 1968 of black lung disease while their companies have fought against the regulations that would have cost them more money, but would have um, protected their workers from the coal mine dust that has taken their lives and, and taken them away from their families. So again, we see a pattern here. So whether it's that the utility business model um, moving towards nuclear energy, this whole notion of false notion of natural gas, uh, waste to energy incinerators, clean coal, carbon capture and sequestration, all a part of the suite of false solutions that are being advanced. And then the, the kind of overarching false solution is the notion that markets will save us, um, that it's the markets that really got us into the situation in the first place. Um, it's capitalist market that is predicated on a notion of there being winners and losers. There's capitalists and then there's folks who are capitalized, cap uh, communities, natural resources, BIPOC bodies and personhood through enslavement, cheap labor and sacrifices. There are the people who, the people, the communities and the planet that is capitalized or commoditized while again, a wealthy few are, um, are are, are reaping profits and, and wealth and power. So, and this is where we have this kind of uh, uh, political system that's really a corporatocracy, corporatocracy, and which has given rise to this uh, notion of corporate personhood that we saw in the uh, advancement of Citizen United. And um, where, as you saw in the, uh, in the spoken word piece where the person said that when making money is good for the market, um, give them a fine, it's fine. And so that really kind of calls out this notion that markets are not are, are really the problem and they're not going to save us. And so whether it's false solutions or false narratives, we have um, false narratives with also deadly consequences, whether it's the, the, the notion of a, the China virus, which gave rise to, which, you know, both gave rise to and exacerbated the hate that has resulted in all of the anti-API um, um, sentiment actions and, and, um, and now death. Uh, we have a past narratives like super predator that puts a bullseye around black youth, um, particularly males. We have this notion of job killing regulations that again, um, 
gives a sense that if the regulations that are meant to save lives are actually um, causing um, are, are making making us lose jobs. And then we have this whole kind of fallacy around scarcity. People have this notion that, and that's what at, what's at the root of so much in terms of this notion of scarcity versus the reality of abundance. This is where we have this challenge around immigration rights, where the U.S. is four percent of the global population, yet twenty five percent of the emissions are drive climate change, which is uh, when I was in Laredo and other places on the border, so many of the folks who were coming in through uh, Central America were coming in because their crops were no longer there, their, their lands were no longer um, uh, able to produce crops because of the shifts in, in, in agricultural yields resulting from climate change. And they came from places where disasters had made their places uninhabitable. We're responsible for all of that. So whether it's that or certainly the, the various wars and armed conflicts that the U.S. pushes and all the ways that we are, are kind of uh, changing the, the various in, in, um, habitability of various nations. And yet when people come seeking refuge, sanctuary, just uh, survival, then we lock our borders and we lock up children and families. And so the haunting chants of the hate groups in Charlottesville riots, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us. This whole notion that of replacement, as if we can't all live in abundance and happiness. Um, and this false scarcity nar narrative is also tied to one of the biggest myths of all as it relates to the United States, which is that this nation was built on the principle of liberty and religious freedom. Because again, it was built on the practice of exploitation, domination, murder and extraction, um, both in terms of the indigenous people who were originally on this land and the extraction of black people from where they were, where we were um, on the motherland. But the truth is to really end on a more positive note as we move towards the end of the, our time together here, there is abundance. There's so much positive abundance. And our, our vision as frontline folks on environmental justice and climate justice is one of just transition, one of shifting away from these, these society and systems around exploitation, extraction, domination to a society that's built around regeneration, cooperation, caring for the sacredness and, um, and deep democracy. And we have this notion of radical imagination, which both of those words in, in our kind of lexicon of society gives a sense of radical. It's just like off the uh, way off in the fringes. Imagination is something that's just idealized and not, not possible. But we know that is, it is possible to shift our society to one that is rooted in regeneration and rehabilitation and redemption and rebirth. Uh, we can have a society that values all and lives in harmony uh, with the earth and reaps the, the abundance of the earth, but is it also regenerative. Um, and we, we, so we can advance systems that are centered around the well-being of all without harm. In this society, we can have a place where people are feeling valued and belonging. We don't have to have racism and misogyny and homophobia and xenophobia. We don't have to have this false notion that for me to be well, somebody else has to be unwell, that I have to capitalize on someone else's um, um, existence in order for for me to be whole. We don't have to have that kind of um, uh, predator kind of, um, I forget the word for it, but, but that kind of uh, um, a parasitic relationships um, between people and systems, though there is enough abundance for us all to do well. So in the society of uh, people feeling valued and belonging, we can have healing and restorative justice to settle trauma, challenges, and tensions of the past, but we can have a new society where those traumas, uh, that we are not generating new traumas because we have a society that, that uplifts and recognizes the value and the well-being of all is central to, to, to the value and, and well-being of each other. Um, in this society, our built environment is designed for biomimicry and is in resonance with regenerative design of the earth. In this society, our energy is something that we can we can draw from solar or wind, and it regenerates, um, and that and and it's and it's plentiful, plentiful and available for all. In the society, our food it can be grown in our local communities through local food justice projects. Um, we have in the society we're not generating all of the waste, and we don't have this disposable society when it comes to waste we're recovering and reusing anything that we are uh, that we have in our 
homes and otherwise. In the society, we have housing for all. We don't have such a large proliferation of people who are unhoused. We have the mobility that everyone needs to get around and that and we don't need as much things to get around because we're really valuing and centering local production. And this uh, society or the economy um, is rooted in new economy principles and practices of circular economies, replacing market-based mechanisms and capitalism that again are predicated on some doing well and many others not doing well. Um, this society we're rooted in so local self-reliance and community self-determination. So as I kind of wrap here, um, I just want to say that uh, my first lengthy visit to Washington State about seven years ago took me to the Daybreak Star Indian Cultural Center, where I saw the promised land. I saw Latinx, API, Indigenous African Americans together, elders and youth, LGBTQ persons, persons with various uh, varying abilities. Um, people of various immigration status and more all really coming together for a day of, of culture work, of joint purpose, of planning and sharing and breaking of bread and cooperation and love. And it was during that visit I met the great folks at um, Front and Centered who were the host along with Day, Daybreak, um, including the NAACP, Seattle King County branch and the Tacoma branch, as well as the groups that have become beloved in our circle, like the Puget Sound Sage group and, and our, our awesome Got Green folks with whom I work in the um, with the Climate Justice Alliance and beyond. Altogether, the, the, the folks were united and around this common vision of a transformed society in the world. In the words of the US Social Forum, another world is possible and another United States is necessary. So my last trip before the COVID restrictions brought me back to Washington State where I was hosted by the Vancouver Washington NAACP where I got to go know the great leaders of the NAACP there who've taken up the mantle of leadership on environmental justice. Um, I also got to reconnect with the folks at Front and Center again, so I came full circle and um, who continue to unite frontline communities to push back against false solutions like market-based mechanism than to push forward um, on um, the radical vision of a world that uplifts all rights for all people. So I started with the frontline community voices of uh, Baytown, Texas, and I'd like to end with another set of frontline community voices um, through another spoken word piece by a sister named Kathy from the Marshall Islands. And it's a poem to her, to her son, um, and it's called Dear Matafeli Painum. So hold on, and here we go. Hmm. Dear Mata Filipino, you are a seven-month-old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg and bald as the Buddha. Your thighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Mata Filipino, I want to tell you about that lagoon that lucid, sleepy lagoon lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day, that lagoon will devour you. They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of your sea walls, and crunch through your island's shattered bones. They say you, your daughter, and your granddaughter too, will wander rootless, with only a passport to call home. Dear Mata Filipino, don't cry. Mommy promises you, no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's gonna become a climate change refugee. Or should I say, no one else. To the Carteret Islanders of Papua New Guinea and to the Taro Islanders of Fiji, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here. Because baby, we are going to fight. Your mommy, daddy, boo-boo, Dima, your country, and your president too, we will all fight. And even though there are those hidden behind platinum titles who like to pretend that we don't exist, that the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Maldives, and Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines and floods of Pakistan, Algeria, and Colombia, and hurricanes, tidal waves, and earthquakes didn't exist? Still, 
there are those who see us. Hands reaching out, fists raising up, banners unfurling, megaphones booming, and we are canoes blocking coal ships. We are the radiance of solar villages. We are the rich, clean soil of the farmer's past. We are petitions blooming from teenage fingertips. We are families biking, recycling, reusing, engineers dreaming, designing, building, artists, painting, dancing, writing. We are spreading the word. And there are thousands out on the street, marching with signs, hand in hand, chanting for change now. They're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us. Because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Dear Mata Filipino, you were eyes heavy with drowsy weight. So just close those eyes, baby, and sleep in peace. Because we won't let you down. You'll see. So thank you.